Hello and welcome to our latest Insider interview. Today in the studio, I have with me Nick Train, full manager of the Lindsay Train UK Equity Fund and the Finsby Growth and Income Investment Trust. Nick, thanks for coming in today. So Nick, you manage money in a similar way to Warren Buffett. You rarely trade and you like to buy and hold for the long term. Could you name an example of a company that all things being equal, you could never envisage selling? Yeah, it's a great question, and, and it, it's, a, it's a too flattering analogy, uh, me and Buffett. It's so important to say, I think, how generous he and Munger have been with their ideas, which are fundamentally sound ideas. I first read them in the mid-1980s, and almost immediately my investment performance began to improve. So everybody needs, it, it doesn't matter whether you're thinking about investing in tech or energy, you, you need to read and understand of it. Um, I, I also think, you know, it's an interesting question because sometimes I, I, people look askance at us when we say, well, our ideal holding period is forever. It, it, you know, it sounds like a really weird thing to say, doesn't it? I mean, particularly most professional investors like to give the impression that they're creating value by trading in and out and they're finding the next hot thing and moving to the next one. I've always thought it's so important. It's so simple, but so powerful. Imagine if you and your family owned a wonderful business and you could pass it down from generation to generation. Why, why would you ever sell it? Our mindset is not oh, let's find the next idea and then the next idea after that. Our mindset, and you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but our mindset is let's find something that ideally we might never have to sell, you know, because that's, that's going to achieve our financial objectives. You know, it's dangerous for me to, to, to name individual companies in a way because they probably have a propensity to blow up, and blow up in my face tomorrow. But to me, you know, in our UK strategy for at least 20 years, um, Di Diageo has been a core major holding. I think it's the third biggest position that we, we have today. And I just can't believe that you could go badly wrong over time if you own a business that owns Johnny Walker and Guinness and Tanqueray and a, a, a whole bar shelf full of beloved beverage brands that have been beloved for, in Guinness's case, more than a quarter of a millennium, not even a quarter of a century, you know. Um, I think that the likelihood that Diageo's brands will both have grown and protected you against the malign effects of monetary inflation for as far ahead as I can see are pretty high, pretty high. And that that's a company that I can't really conceive of selling unless the world is gonna go teetotal. And, you know, maybe that's a serious risk, but, but I'm not feeling it when I look at my sons. <laughs> um, so, so that's what I would say. Both the fund and the investment trust, you have a lot of exposure to consumer-related businesses. Given the wider macroeconomic backdrop, you know, some commentators think that the UK may be in for a recession in 2024. Do you think most of these companies, if not all, will be able to weather the storm of a recession? A risk of what we do is looking at the past and extrapolating from the past. Sometimes the future is different from the past and we all need to be alert to that but it you know it's so important to note that some of the great consumer brands that we're invested in have gone through multiple recessions and interest rate cycles and okay maybe the growth has slowed down a bit during a deep recession but essentially that the, this is the point about beloved consumer brands that people feel that their life would be poorer if they didn't allow themselves the occasional Guinness. The best of these businesses historically have protected you in times of recession, and I imagine they will continue to do so. 
I do think, and this is a, a, a nuance perhaps but in the margin of my portfolio, I've been building more exposure looking at these consumer stocks to true luxury or premium brands than I might have done 20 years ago. I do think that the world has changed a bit. Consumers around the world actually are getting wealthier and what gradually enriching consumers want, and I'm talking globally, are heritage and luxury products. So our holding in Burberry, for instance, that is a bigger holding today for me than it would have been 10 or 15 years ago, because I think that yeah, that trend towards consumption of luxury is, is likely to be uh, a long lasting one. You have concentrated portfolios. The Fund and Investment Trust have around 20 stocks. In terms of the top 10 holdings, they account for around 80% of the Fund and the Investment Trust. Does this provide enough diversification? Well, I, I think that 20 holdings is a nice number. It's risky. <laughs> it's risky, but listen, you've educated your viewers and readers well enough to know that active managers have to take some risk. I mean, because otherwise there's passive, there's ETFs, there's, there's a whole lot of things you can do if you don't want, if you just want the index. We've got to try and take some risk to beat the index. The risk we've chosen to take is portfolio concentration but if we do our job well, concentration on high quality businesses. Now, let me be completely candid with you. I'm not so thrilled with our investment performance over the last two to three years. There are a number of holdings that because they've not done as well as I've hoped, have got smaller within the portfolio as our winners have gone on. And I'd like to see some of the things that haven't done so well over the last couple of years do better and make the portfolio less, does that make sense? Make the portfolio less concentrated if some of the smaller positions do better. In terms of the day-to-day -day dealings with company management, how actively involved are you in terms of challenging company management if there's a, an issue that you see in a company that you want change for the better? I would say quite active when there is an issue. There's almost no company that we're invested in where I think that we are qualified to tell current management how to run the business better. I look at the businesses we're invested in, I admire them. I don't see how to actually run the business better than uh, current, current management. Occasionally there are issues about capital allocation. Um, so like how much dividend are they paying? Are they paying too much dividend? Should they be doing a share buyback? Should they be investing more aggressively in the more promising areas of their business? The, those sorts of strategic capital allocation questions w we will engage because that really can make a difference. We're not telling companies how to run the business better on a day-to-day -day basis. We're just not qualified to do that. There have been a number of full management retirements over the past couple of years. Now, I know you've not got any plans to hang up your boots anytime soon because yourself and Michael Lindsell, the co-founder, announced last year that you'll run money for at least another seven years. But is succession planning something that you, you are starting to put into place? And is there a protege? There is a succession plan in, in place. Listen, let me put it this way. Throughout the bulk of my career, I've had one overarching ambition, burning ambition, which is to make our clients' savings as valuable as we possibly can. I, I, I mean, that, that's, that's what I want to do. And I still really, really want to do that. Not least because I'm <laughs> invested in these strategies as well. I really am. It really does matter to me and my family how, this, how these strategies do. I do find over the last four or five years that I, I have a, a second ambition. Maybe it's a subsidiary ambition, but it's still a real ambition. And that is um, we have uh, we've built a team 
Mike and I have built a team of, let's call them younger people. They're not necessarily that young anymore, but they're younger than me. And if I have a subsidiary ambition, it's that I really hope that those people who've joined our business, who've worked with us in some cases 13 or 14 years, that they have an opportunity to express themselves um, running money within the context of Lens or Train. And I hope in the end they have as rewarding and fun a time as I've had. Um, and what that means is that if I'm to fulfill that second ambition, at some point we are going to need to hand some responsibility over to the people who, who are working with us. Um, candidly, I think if I quit tomorrow, there are two or three people in our team who could walk into this job and do it possibly even better than me. <laughs> who knows? I, I mean, I think they're ready for it. Um, so yes, we've given it thought. Yes, we've got a team becoming more and more competent, you know, day by day. But I've still got that burning ambition to make these strategies work. And you've just touched on the answer to my last question. In terms of skin in the game, do you invest in all of the funds and trusts that you manage? I'm invested in every single product, I hate that word, that, that we have at Linsel Train. Um, but uh, b because the UK strategy, you know, that's where my longest track record is, that's where my real day-to-day -day focus is, that's actually where the bulk of my, my savings are. Um, and enough to matter. <laughs> That's all I would say. Sadly, the correlation between having skin in the game and necessarily generating great performance, there's no direct guarantee, but at least you can assure the investors that what happens truly matters. It really does truly matter to me. Nick, thank you for your time today. Well, Carl and Jules, thank you and uh, your viewers. That's it for this episode. You can check out the rest of our Insider Interview series on our YouTube channel. You can like, comment and subscribe and I'll hopefully see you again. <laughs>